Welcome to the Positive Productivity Podcast, episode number 42. Welcome to Positive Productivity Podcast, where we empower our audience to achieve and appreciate personal and professional success, especially in the face of adversity. Listen in as our guests reveal their stories of challenges and hurdles and how they overcame defeat and became triumphant in their endeavors. Let's get motivated and move forward with your host, Kim Sutton. Welcome back to another episode of Positive Productivity. This is your host, Kim Sutton. And today I am thrilled to have Billy Murphy from foreverjobless.com with us. Welcome, Billy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so thrilled to have you here. Listeners, I was introduced to Billy, not directly, like not, not like this, a few months ago through a podcast that I was listening to and absolutely loved your story, Billy. So I am going to ask that you share a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey with the listeners and more about what you are doing now. Sure. So I guess, you know, I've always kind of been entrepreneurial ever since I was a kid, you know, but I'll, I'll start, I guess, from, you know, as a professional poker player after college. So I played poker professionally for about four years. You know, I didn't want to do it forever. So I decided to start a poker company. The goal had always been, you know, work for myself and, you know, invest and start businesses. And so, you know, the next step after poker was to invest some of the, some of my poker earnings starting a a poker company. Uh, So I started a poker company and then maybe two years later branched off into e-commerce stores. So I probably had about 20 small niche e-commerce stores. And then somewhere in the middle there, probably, uh, probably either right before, right back, right after the e-commerce stores, started forever jobless and just kind of started sharing the stories, you know, decisions I was making, you know, why did I buy a certain store? Why did I sell a certain product? Why did I get into a specific niche? How was I marketing that kind of stuff? And that's where forever jobless kind of came about. I just enjoyed sharing the adventures of being an entrepreneur and, you know, I thought I could help other people going through the same journey, you know, because I try and look at things that are from a pretty analytical, logical standpoint and, you know, I was sending articles to friends, you know, most people don't know this. I was actually, you know, friends would ask me business questions and I would write them huge. You know, if you've read my post, you know, that I tend to write really, really long content and so I'd, friend, I'd send friends, you know, these basically blog posts, but I didn't have a blog. And so finally I decided, why don't I put all these emails that I'm sending friends? Why don't I start, you know, turning future ones into, into blog posts? And so I started Forever Jobless, I guess probably maybe a couple of years later, launched the Forever Jobless podcast as well. And so... Yeah, now basically I just got back from a year of traveling where I was just traveling around writing. And so really haven't had a big business focus this last year, just kind of just kind of traveling. But yeah, starting starting to ramp up Robert Job was probably quarter one this year coming up. And yeah, working on the incubator. The incubator is basically we help people start profitable businesses. And so, you know, we'll take a group. The group size is thirty six. So we take thirty six people and basically help them launch uh, companies from scratch. So we help them find the find the idea. We help them figure out how to market it. We show them how to do due diligence on competitors. And then we basically look at you know what their goal is. And we make sure that the business that they're thinking about starting matches up with their goal. And that ties into what we were, you know, you mentioned before the dream life article, you know, very related because a lot of people don't match up, you know, their dream life, so to speak, with uh, whatever venture they're pursuing and they don't match up. And obviously it causes problems either they're making they're working too hard to make more money than they need, or they're in an opportunity that is not going to make them enough money for the life they want. So yeah, most of my time right now is now that I'm done traveling for a little while is probably going to be writing content for forever jobless and just helping people start businesses. Oh, I love that. Where were you traveling? I was all over. So I started in Colombia and then I went to Bali and then I did South Africa. And then I hung out for a while. Uh, my parents have a, a summer home on the East Coast. And so I hung out a while there as well. That's incredible. I would love the digital nomad lifestyle. However, I would need to send my kids to you for a bit so I could make it possible. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very interesting that you're helping people through the incubator how you are. And I am curious how much their passion plays into finding the opportunity that's going to work for them. Because so many entrepreneurs that I've come in contact with know that they want to start a business, but they really don't know what they're passionate about before they do. And they look at it from the standpoint of money and not about what they really want to be doing. Is that something Mm -hmm. that you address in the incubator? 
Yeah, quite a bit, actually. In the early stages, that's something we talk about a lot because, you know, there's, I think that people view, um, often view profit and passion a little bit incorrectly. And, and by that, I mean, usually people are, are basically all in on, I need to find something that makes the most money or they're all in on, I need to find something that I'm passionate about. And neither is optimal in a lot of cases. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you just chased an opportunity that made the most money, which I think we've all probably fallen in the trap in some way before, you know, we just do something because we think we think we can make money with it. We, if we don't like it at all, then we're not going to have fun. And the byproduct is we're probably not actually going to make the money, even if it was a great opportunity, because we don't love it enough to get to the end result, which often in- involves, you know, if you do something being good enough at it to make the money where, you know, a lot of people start out and they don't know about a certain subject, but if they like it enough, they can become good enough and to get the end result of whatever that venture or activity would have brought them. But the way it works is often, you know, someone just goes after the money and then they say, this is hard. It doesn't work. And if they're not passionate about it, they won't often get to the end result that they wanted in the first place. However, a lot of times people can be, if you're passionate enough, I, I always tell people you either need to be passionate about what you're doing or passionate about the end result, what you're doing will bring you. So in other words, to reference the dream life again, it's, you know, if you, if there was something that you didn't like doing, but you wanted a certain life and you knew that a certain route could get you there. Now, if you were so passionate about that life that you wanted or that thing that you wanted or basically just the result, it would probably inspire you to go through the hard parts to get to the end, to where you would create the result that, that you wanted, even though you weren't necessarily passionate about what you were doing. In other words, like, for example, let's say there was a task that, you know, you, 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 you know, someone wanted you to do and they said, I'll pay you a thousand dollars an hour. Even if you didn't like the task, there's probably quite a few things that, you know, could potentially change your life if you started working for a thousand dollars an hour. So you might be passionate enough about, okay, I'm going to save up an extra hundred thousand dollars and I'm passionate about, I'll be able to, whatever it is, buy a new car, like go on vacation with my family, you know, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is to the person doing it. So I don't think working for money is bad if you have an end result that you're passionate enough about. On the flip side, I don't think it's bad to work on an opportunity where it's not necessarily the most profitable, but if you're passionate enough about it, number one, you're going to you know, like it the whole time. But number two, often what happens is you'll get significantly better than any of the competitors in the market because of the fact that you like it so much more than them. So basically, they're not going to be able to compete with you long term because you like it so much more they're doing it for the money. You're doing it because you actually enjoy it. And so what actually ends up happening a lot of times is the people that just like it more than others, stick it out longer, become better. And a couple of years into the business or you know, blogging or podcasting or anything else, they actually have significantly better results than they expected because of the fact that they liked it so much. That is so powerful. And that is actually a struggle that I have experienced myself in this past year was transforming or transitioning, I should say, from doing what was making money to what was what I am truly passionate about. And I'm already seeing that the money is starting to flow for that. So I love that you brought that up. I also found that when I was working on tasks that I wasn't passionate about, like you were saying before, I would procrastinate on them. Well, you didn't say procrastinate, but I would procrastinate. The results would come back really not as good. Clients wouldn't be as happy. Less referrals would come. And it was a vicious cycle of downward momentum, I would have to say. Yeah. Yeah, totally. No, I can relate. I think most most things that remain on uh, some form of to-do list for me are just the stuff that I don't I don't have any interest in doing. If I if I liked them, I would have done them and I wouldn't have done them because they were on the to-do list. I would have just done them because I liked them and it was something that I like doing. And actually one of the things I do now is I track, you know, all my tasks. Every week I set basically, you know, the next week's plan for the week. And I, and I input the really important things into the week. You know, Monday, these couple of things got to get done. Tuesday, these couple of things. And then I'll have kind of a pile of a to-do list that, you know, if it doesn't get done, it's not important, but um, that I try to get done if I can. And, you know, what I do over time is I start looking at all the things I was doing and then anything that I'm not enjoying doing, I try to completely eliminate it from the list, either by stop doing that activity in general, if it's not important enough or outsource it as soon as possible. And, and that way, you know, I'm working on things that either, either I'm passionate about and I really enjoy doing, or 
that I'm really good at it and, and it would be hard to outsource. So in other words, like nobody, uh, if you've heard the term unique ability, like a unique ability of mine that, you know, you can't just necessarily hire someone for, if that makes sense. Oh, it absolutely makes sense. Billy, how do you track your to-do list items? I'm very non-technical with it. Basically, I'll, you know, I'll have a list of however many things. And I don't, I don't believe in having, um, you know, I have a to-do list, but I don't believe in like trying to get them all done necessarily. Like I guess in theory, I would try to get them all done, but I basically, at the end of every week, I kind of have, I take an hour or two and go through everything I did the week before, go through everything, you know, kind of my goals, what I'm trying to achieve, look at what I think I should do the next week, plan it out. And then, yeah, basically I just do the best I can at doing as many of the important things as I can and kind of disregarding the rest. I think a lot of people get distracted by, they do a lot of the little things really well, and then they forget the big things, but the big things are all that really matter when it comes to uh, like, are you going to hit the goal or not? So I'm, I'm probably pretty bad at getting a lot of the little things done, but usually pretty good at getting the big things done. And so I'll take literally sometimes at least an hour or two and just sit there thinking about what I need to do for you know the following week. And actually something that's helped me a lot is every single week during that time, during the hour or two time, I'll actually compose an email and I'll write an email to a friend of mine every single week, like for the last probably almost two years now. And the email basically documents like, here's what I did the last week. Here's what I'm doing the following week. Here's why I'm doing it. And, you know, I often include like, here's, you know, why I think this is a good idea or why I enjoy it and you know why I'm not doing X, Y, or Z. And it's really helped clarify like what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And if it makes sense, because it's, I think it's sometimes really easy to trick yourself into thinking like, Oh, I should, I should just do this. But when I found that the process of writing something, writing something by itself helps, but writing something that someone else is going to read helps because you're not going to BS yourself into tricking yourself into doing something if you don't really want to do it or it's not the right thing to do. And so, yeah, it's just uh, kind of the hour or two of, of clarity really helps set the week for me. Would you consider your friend to be an accountability partner then? Yeah, totally. Yep. We were officially, I would have to say, introduced, even though that's not really the right word, because it was more like an email coming with your name on it from Todd Herman. And I went through Todd's 90 day year program last year and loved part of the program where he talks about the $10 activity versus the $1,000 activity. And that's been such a shift in my business is getting those $10 activities off my plate. And I think that's very comparable to what you were talking about with those big activities that really are your. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know where you're going with it. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then, and that's, and I think that's the, the biggest reason why, if you ask, you know, there's a lot of people that I, I want to be successful is, you know, is, is their big thing. And, but if you just looked at what they, what they did that day, usually none of the time is spent on something that could make them successful. It's usually done on the little things, you know, whether it's email or whether it's commenting on something or, you know, reading articles online or meetings and coffees and that, that kind of stuff. And then don't get me wrong. Some of that is okay. Some of the time, but I think a lot of people do it, you know, a hundred times more than they should, where I think people, if you look at a consumption versus a producer mindset, I think a lot of people are not producing a lot of value. They're, they're basically, looking at the value that someone else is doing and they're consuming it and they're looking at that as productive, but it's good to produce or it's good to consume, you know, valuable content and do some of those activities, but then they need to be put to use or your time remains the same in terms of like the value of time. So if we think about the value of time, you know, someone that only acquires knowledge and doesn't, doesn't execute on it probably doesn't improve their earning ability, for example, uh, as much as they think, even though they're busy all the time doing things that, potentially make them smarter. And at the same time, they could be working 24 hours a day, but someone who's only working on the right things for an hour a day is going to crush them at, at the same goal. You know, I think it's just, just a matter of like, what are the big things? And I've gotten comfortable over time. Just if I don't do a lot of the things I was supposed to do that day or, or that week, but I did the, I did the couple things that mattered. I'm okay. Like I go to bed feeling pretty good about the day when I mess up and I do a lot of little things and I didn't get the big things done. That's when I go to sleep knowing that oh, I really messed up. I didn't get the things I was supposed to do done and where I think most people focus on, okay, I did 17 things today where I can say I did, I did one thing today. Like I haven't done very much today yet. 
think I did a call and I think I handled a couple emails I had to get back on, but that's, that's all I did, but they were important. Like they moved things forward for me where there was a lot of other tasks I could have done today that wouldn't have moved anything forward, but would have, would have made me feel busier and more, more productive, but it wouldn't, it would have been tricking me into thinking I was doing something that moved the needle. Oh, absolutely. That is so important to know. And I've been stuck in that busy track versus the productive track. And mm-hmm. then weeks go by and months go by. And I'm still in the same spot as I was in when I started and scratching my head as to why things haven't improved, why the situation hasn't improved. Yeah. Listeners, uh, I want you to know that you can find all the show notes at thekimsutton.com forward slash PP042. The link to Billy's Dream Life article, as well as another article I want to talk about briefly, if you don't mind, Billy, how to achieve goals. Those will both be in, but you should definitely go take a look at foreverjobless.com because these are just two articles out of many that will definitely be beneficial and not a waste of time. It will be a productive use of time if you go over, not just keeping you busy. Is that fair, Billy? Yeah, totally. What you're just talking about, rather than being busy, these will definitely be a productive use of time. Totally. I think if people implement the things that are in them, I think it, I think they'll be very helpful. In the how to achieve goals article, one of the biggest points that I think you make is how people, including myself, make so many goals for themselves. And rather than accomplishing one or two, they really don't accomplish any because they're trying to shoot multiple targets instead of one and often they miss them all. Is this something that, well, I I do believe you addressed it in the article, but was this something that you yourself experienced? 100%. And and, and a lot of the things I write on, it's it's because of struggle with them so much that I find it like such an important topic to cover. Because yeah, I have have the shiny object syndrome as much as anybody. I mean, that's one of the things that with uh, with being an entrepreneur, there's you see so many opportunities. Like there's so many things I see that I could do, and then I realize if I really try to do a lot of these things, that I'm going to be successful at none of them, which which happens a lot. And you know, over the last however many years, I've gotten better at you know really trying to dial back and say I'm not going to do these ten things. I'm going to do like try and start with this one and 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 scale from there. And so you know whether it's been you know I've done a range of things, whether it's you know, I'll take, I'll, I'll take short focused bursts of time. And basically, you know, when it, when it was, you know, me launching the podcast, that's, that's really the only thing I did every day for, you know, a, a couple month period. Like that's what I did. I had a certain goal for that. And, and then I did that and, and hit the goal, you know, and I had fitness goals, the same thing. Like I said, you know, I'm not going to do anything for the day until I go to the gym. And this is, these are all the meals I'm eating. I don't eat anything else. And then like you hit the goal and it's not a surprise because you just, that, that was the thing. Then you can still do other things the rest of the day, but you must do the most important thing before anything else. There's a good book that talks about this. The one thing is a good book that, that talks about that quite a bit, but yeah. And then writing the same thing, the same things happen. I just, you know, when I make something a priority goal, I, I do it first thing in the morning and like, I don't do anything else. I don't worry about what's on the to-do list or, you know, if I have something going on later, it doesn't matter. The first X amount of hours per day is dedicated towards making sure I get the thing that will help me hit my goal done. And so that's helped a lot. And I think that the other thing that's helped a lot that I guess I've done this for quite a while, but I think most people miss the mark on is what is the result you want and work backwards from that. I think a lot of people set goals in a very general way, which it's almost not a goal. It's a dream. They don't have a a, a process like how, that's going to get them to the end result. So like an easy example is fitness, right? So just because there's fewer variables. So if you said, I want to be in X, X shape, whether it's, you know, body fat percentage or whether it's, you know, pounds, you know, losing a certain amount of weight, gaining a certain amount of weight, muzzle weight, all you, all someone would have to do is figure, okay, well, what, what are the specific meals I would have to have to eat to do this? What is the specific exercises I have to do? And obviously you could get you know, feedback like that from, from a trainer or a nutritionist. And then, okay, how long do I have to do that for? And then just do that on a daily basis. And you can guarantee the achievement of, of a lot of your goals that way. And obviously as you get into business, there's, you know, the variables expand, there's more variables, there's more types of marketing you can do. There's more, like there's so many other things, but also a lot of times they act as distractions because there is so many other things you can do. But, you know, if you just figured out, 
like, what is one thing, like what is one marketing channel that I could just dominate? Like, wh- let me go focus on that for a while. And, you know, and I tried that with, for example, Instagram, I set the same little 30 day or 90 day goal and built, you know, built a very large Instagram following doing that. And I think, and now we have over a hundred thousand Instagram followers and it was just from setting a micro burst of time where like, that's the only thing I concentrated it on. And I think most people, another thing set very long, long goals. And, and basically they're not goals they're dreams In five years, I want to do this and 10 years, I want to do this. And there's not, they're not reverse engineering how they would get there. They're just stating something they would like to have, which doesn't mean you, you plan Billy. So I usually, the longest I'll go is a year, but I don't really, I don't set a year plan. Usually what I do is, and it's probably very similar to Todd. I, I've heard quite a bit from Todd on this, on this stuff is that often I'll do like a, a 90 day or even a 30 day challenge where, okay, like this is the result I want in 90 days or 30 days. And this is a daily activity that I'll have to do that to do that. So for example, let's say I set a 90 day goal, you know, I'm, I'm figuring out the goal my 90 day goal that I want to achieve. And basically I'm setting, you know, weekly benchmarks, for example, that you know, every week I'm going to do a review and see if I'm on track for that 90 day goal, you know, see if I'm on target, see, is there anything I need to adjust? Is there, you know, do I need to be doing different marketing? Is this marketing not working? Did this marketing be scaled? You know, I'm asking all the questions on a, on a weekly basis and then setting up the next week plan and, and diving back in, knowing that if I just achieve these couple things each day, that I'll achieve my goal. And then you can always expand it. If you achieve the, you know, the daily goal, you're going to achieve the weekly goal. If you achieve the weekly goal, you'll achieve the monthly goal. If you achieve the monthly goals, you'll achieve the yearly goal. But I think, you know, most people don't, don't last that long. But part of the reason they don't last that long is because they don't set it up like that. They say, I'm going to hit this. This is the goal I want to hit. And then by February, they don't even remember what they, what they set out to do. That's just like so many people setting their New Year's resolutions. And I'm going to use your gym or your, your body comparison like the gym memberships will dramatically increase as a result of New Year's resolutions. But I believe I've read numerous times that by the third week in January, already participation and people showing up to the gym has decreased so significantly just because people don't have that plan in action. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I hate, I actually hate going to the gym in January. It's so crowded. And then by February, I'm, I'm excited because, you know, I'm always like, oh, all the, all the New Year's resolution, resolutioners are left. Uh, so the gym's back to normal. <laughs> they should have a private room at the gym just that they only open up for the New Year's resolutioners. And yep. if they graduate that month, they can move on. Coming from someone who has difficulty making it through the first month. <laughs> well, it's, it's hard. And that's why, like, it's, you know, it, they talk about, you know, everybody talks about habits and how important habits are, but you know, most of the time achieving a goal is just, if you can just generate a habit around the, the task that would help you accomplish your goal. And I found that by doing that, it makes it easy. It makes goal, you know, accomplishing your goal relatively easy. And so if you can just set things up to make achieving the habit easier, you know, whether it's, you know, gym, for example, a lot of people use the the example of just, just put your shoes right by your bed and your gym clothes. So you get out of bed and go to the gym first thing, or, you know, whether for me, for example, it was every Wednesday, I set an appointment with a trainer and I would get everything measured, my, my weight, my body fat, my workouts, you know, tracks and all that. And, and then every two days a week, I would have somebody bring me meals, specific meals that I should be eating and nothing else was in my fridge. And so like, those were the two things I did that basically like it was very hard to fail because I'd already set things that like guarantee to have it. Like I couldn't accidentally eat McDonald's because I would have to like leave the house and like go out of my way to get something that I wasn't supposed to eat. Like then all my food was already cooked and in my fridge that I was supposed to eat. Um, and the trainer was expecting me every single Wednesday, you know? So I think a lot of times you can make it easy just by setting up a way to get the habit without even thinking about it. Oh, absolutely. Plus your investment. I'm not saying there's not an investment for a gym membership, but your investment was stepped up just a little bit more by hiring the trainer and by setting yourself up with the meal delivery. Yeah. Going from there, I'd love to know, were there any major investments that you made in your business that have helped you achieve really big goals? Like financial investments? Yeah. I mean, you know, just just having the being okay with, with pulling the trigger on investing. Like for example, a lot of people wouldn't have made the financial investments that I would have to start, you know, companies, especially before I really had experience. But 
you know, I knew not taking the chance means I, I, I fail by default because I'm, you know, the return I get is nothing. And you lose all the snowball effect too, where if you invest in yourself and you continually get better, you're starting from a different point each time. And so, you know, now each time I, I start a business, I'm, I have significantly higher upside, significantly better chance of succeeding because I've already done it so many times in the past where, you know, I could see the same exact opportunity as somebody else, but if they've never played the game and we get in the, the same opportunity, it's not going to be any surprise if I win that game, so to speak, because I've bet on myself in the past. And so I think just betting on myself consistently has helped. And, and obviously you'll win some and you lose some, but it's, it's given me obviously you know, all my success if I hadn't made the, made the investments, but I see people who are just as smart as me and, you know, potentially like just as driven, but they're just not willing to bet on themselves, not willing to make the investment. And so they lose all the upside of, you know, getting the reward. So, you know, I've made investments where, you know, you, you make a five figure investment and you get paid, you know, 10 X, 20 X, 50 X, what you would have made or what you, what you would have invested where the same person who says, you know what, I don't want to risk losing 10 grand or 20 grand, but they lose all the upside and never, they can never succeed on a large level where I think that's the biggest thing is pretty much every step of the way I'm, I'm okay with investing money to scale something if if I think I want that I want the end result and or if I'm if I'm passionate about it. Like Forever Jobless, I've always treated Forever Jobless kind of like a it was just a passion project, just a side project. But in uh in quarter one of this year, 2017 coming up, I'm expecting to probably spend a hundred thousand dollars on advertising just in quarter one, just to you know, just try try and turn it into a real business. Now, is that a risk? Like would it would it be less risky to to just write free blog posts and and you know, have pure profit margin, basically. Um, yeah, it's way less risky, but you also lose the upside. And so, yeah, quarter one, I'll probably spend, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000 just on advertising and just to test some things out and see how it goes. And and a lot of that advertising I haven't done before. I mean, I definitely haven't done it with Forever Jobless. And so, you know, there's risk involved, but there's also lots of upside. I think people forget to factor in the upside. How much of business failure do you think is associated with lack of confidence on the entrepreneur side? How do you mean? I'm going to use a personal example here. When I first started working with my business coach a year and a half ago, I had a lot of work coming in. And I mean a lot of work, but I wasn't charging enough for my services. And when he asked why I was charging what I was, it was because I wasn't confident enough to ask for more. And I believe. You know, a lot of people could be listening and thinking, oh my gosh, $100,000, that's such a large amount of money to be spending on advertising. But when you have confidence in the services that you're offering and in the content and the deliverables, it's easier to make big moves like that. And I feel like I'm answering a question for you, but I'm you, you may very well have your own opinions, but I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs can get a lot further than they do do or did if they just had a little bit more confidence in themselves. Sure. Yeah. And I think confidence comes from, yeah, just continually betting on yourself and, and, and failure comes with it. But uh, every time you fail, like you also learn the downside isn't really that bad. You temporarily fail and, and usually you learn lessons that you carry to the next bet you make. So yeah. So anytime I fail, like I don't view it as like, oh, I'll never do that again. I view it as like, oh, this is great. Like I'll know where I failed for next time and, and increase my odds next time. Oh, absolutely. I'm looking at your My Story page. And again, listeners, you can find any of the resources and articles that I'm talking about and we're talking about at thekimsutton.com forward slash PP042. But I'm looking at your My Story page and you share about your first entrepreneurial venture was when you were 17 and you bought and sold sports cards collections. Now, I do have to admit, I'm a little bit worried about my sons hearing the story because their room is a mess enough already. But I love how you say that you snuck large quantities of cards into your house (laughs) when your parents weren't home because they didn't want you buying anymore. Is the entrepreneurial spirit or is is it in the bloodline of your family? No, I I think I was the first entrepreneur in our, our, uh, at least in my immediate family. So how do your... I just had to ask, how do your parents feel now seeing where you have gone since the days of slinging newspapers when you were nine and your in your business card or your sports card collection buying and selling? What are their thoughts 
they like it. They're, they're very supportive. And yeah, I think they, I think they enjoy watching, you know, kind of what, you know, what I'll do next and, you know, following along with the adventures, but yeah, they've been supportive. You, you know, they're not, they weren't entrepreneurial themselves, but, uh, I think they, I think it worried them a little bit in the beginning just cause it's not, it's not normal, I guess, for most people, you know, especially with, I started, you know, playing poker professionally. And so that was, that was a big jump as well from the most people, you know, go to school and then get a job. I went to school and, you know, became a professional poker player. So, so I think, I, I think I probably trained them along the way to expect uh, the unexpected. <laughs> I love that. And I was the black sheep growing up. I was the one who went to art school while my sisters and my brother went on for their professional degrees. So I I can definitely feel that. Billy, what I I know you said that quarter one of 2017 is having a major push on forever jobless. What are some of your other major goals looking forward into 2017? Um, well, I haven't sat down and worked them all out yet, but one of the things on the, on the list is writing a book. So I'd like to write a book, but again, it's going to come down to what I, what I have room for on the, on the goals plate, but yeah, writing the book is up there, you know, getting back in the the fitness shape I was in back when I competed in the show probably two years ago. And so I'd like to get back in, in that kind of shape Yeah, and scaling up forever jobless. I've debated running another incubator. And so, you know, if, if we do do that again, you know, we'd like it to be uh, a very successful class, very successful students. So um, yeah, the goals will, you know, probably most of them, there's a couple others that, that, that I'd like to do, but likely won't make, won't make the list just because it's, you know, want to focus. Oh, absolutely. How do you make the determination of what makes the list and what does not? Uh, just a combination of, uh, you know, making sure that I'm going to enjoy it, you know, seeing the end results of, you know, what each goal will, will help do in terms of like, what are the next goals that I want to accomplish? So a lot of them are kind of intertwined, for example, a book and, and forever jobless are very related, uh, forever jobless and the incubator very related. So, you know, the goals, it it often allows you to have more than one goal because they're all pretty much related. A lot of my activities will help all the goals. Absolutely. Better than to be jumping around all over kingdom come doing things that aren't going to benefit each other. Yeah. I have one more question just because I know some Listeners probably heard at the beginning when when you said that you had 15 to 20 e-commerce stores. How did you manage them all? Were you handling delivery and stock yourself or did you have a drop shipping program? How did you how did you manage? I just I hired uh, some employees to, to run the stores and they know customer service and phone calls and products. But we were drop shipping everything. And so it was a little bit easier model to run. But yeah, I didn't. I, I basically focused on acquiring, acquiring the stores and starting them up and then I'd hand them off and let other people run them. I wish I had known about that. I had a, I had my own online store when I started my business in 2000. Oh, nice. Yeah. But again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I wasn't passionate about the products I was selling and I was also trying to handle it all myself. So I sort of had a double whammy of this is not the way to do it right there. Yeah. Well, Billy, thank you so much for joining me on Positive Productivity today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Where can listeners find you? I'm sure they've already picked up on the website, but where can they find you and what are the best ways to get in touch with you? Yeah, they can go to uh, foreverjobless.com and they can read the blog on uh, foreverjobless.com slash blog. And yeah, they can, they can uh, check me out on the website. And uh, I don't do a lot of social media, but if they, if they wanted to follow on social media, they can follow on uh, Instagram is uh, the handle is foreverjobless. Fabulous. Well, thank you again, Billy. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Hey there, this is Kim Sutton, host of the Positive Productivity Podcast, and I just want to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it and were inspired, I would love to hear your feedback. Please take a moment or two and visit the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or on my website at thekimsutton.com to leave your rating or review. I'd also like to invite you to join the Positive Productivity Book Club and to find out more about my coaching packages by visiting thekimsutton.com. Until the next episode, I hope you have a positive and productive day.